Good morning. How are you all? Good. Our beloved pastor is off on his 65th birthday trip. So he is out of the t out of town. Um, so yeah, he, uh, man, 65, that's crazy. He does not look it. That's crazy. Um, so before we get started, so I'm Josh, I'm the youth guy here. Um, I wanted to kind of give you guys a little bit of a recap from camp, and we had a really sweet time um, at camp this year. So first of all, I just want to thank you all for praying. Um, thank you all for those of you that, that got to take bands. Um, and I, I, I love hearing from you all that, hey, how did so-and-so do? I really, I was praying for them all week, right? And if you haven't found me to do that, so um, come find me. But, um, but man, I, I'm so thankful because because this is, in my opinion, the best week of the year that we get to experience. And man, uh, so much of it is, is thankful, is, is thanks to you guys for, for praying, for giving, for, for loving on um, students. We had several that, um, that got to go because of you all. And so, uh, man, just thank you so much for, for all that you guys um, do to, to support and love this, this church body. Um, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I think this was the biggest camp we've had um, at, at least in recent memory, we had 58 students go this year um, and then 16 leaders, so um, really sweet time. Um, we had a lot of high school girls. Um, I think Addie had 10 in her cabin, or no, 12 in her cabin, and then um, Courtney had 10, which um, if you've been at a camp cabin before, that's a lot. Um, so yeah, it, really sweet. Um, I think honestly one of my biggest takeaways was it was really sweet to watch the students kind of minister to each other in a way. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen them do that to that level before, um, but each each night during the altar call, it was I was just watching student after student, hey, will you come pray with me? Hey, let, let's go pray. And uh, that that's really sweet to watch it. It, it was it was kind of sobering as a leader because it I, at the the whole time I was like I feel like I should be doing something who you know but they were all kind of praying with each other and kind of ministering to each other and so uh, that was that was probably the the biggest thing that all that all take away from this camp is just seeing that growth and that maturity. Brian Calloway was our speaker this year. He did a phenomenal job. As you can see, our camp theme was in everything give thanks and that, that's a tough theme because there's some tough things that these students have gone through and there's some tough things that you all in this room have gone through and to think about the fact that God wants us to give thanks in everything is, is, is kind of mind-blowing to be honest and I had a, I had a few students um, you know talk to me during the week of I, I mean I'm really struggling or I really struggled to give God thanks for this event that happened in my life but if he's commanding me to do it, I got to do it. And so Brian spoke uh, four nights for us. And that, as you guys know, he came back and preached Sunday morning. Um, so we had five messages in four days. So uh, he rocked it. It was so sweet. Um, I was so, so grateful for, for all, all that God gave him to speak. And then uh, Mike, Mike Meyer, for the second year in a row, wrote a song for our camp, which was really sweet. The previous year, our, our camp theme was Found Faithful, and he wrote a song for that that we've sung up here a few times um, in main service. But then he wrote a new song for us this year, and the students loved it once again, just around that, that theme of in everything, give thanks. And so, man, I, I want to just continue to say thank you all for, for just allowing us to have such a sweet week. It was, um, it was an honor. Um, to, to be with the, the students in our youth group and just to watch them grow. And so a little bit of a plug for you all, uh, July 31st will be, that's a Wednesday night, we'll be in here doing our camp celebration. So during those nights we will we'll sing. Um, I'm uh, making Mike come back again to play for us so we can have some music and then we'll do some testimonies from some of the students and leaders um, and then we'll also uh, uh, be doing some baptisms as well so um, so yeah praise the Lord it was really sweet week um, and I'm man, just on on cloud night honestly just just watching all that God did so thank you once again so we're going to kind of look at something um, a little bit unique this morning and in, in looking at how God not only speaks through nature, but then also confirms things through nature. So what our morning teaching time at camp was all centered around the book of Job. Uh, so we, cover, we covered Job chapter 1 the first day, Job chapter 2 the second day, and then Job chapter 3 through 43, something like that. We kind of summarized um, at the end. And man, it, it, was, it was a really sweet time, especially with our, with our theme. And th there's a cool verse in Job chapter 12, verse 7 and 8. It says, but ask now the beast and they shall teach thee. 
and the fowls of the air, and they shall tell thee. Or speak to the earth, and it shall teach thee, and the fishes of the, of the sea shall declare unto thee. And so we see in Scripture that God uses nature and the things around us to teach us of him. And so as we, as we get ready to, to um, discuss that this morning, let's pray. Father God, we love you. God, we are so thankful, God, for, for what you've done in our lives, in our church body, God. We're, we're, we're grateful to, uh, to be wrapping up another uh, Mighty Might season, God, that's been so sweet uh, to, see, to see members of the community out here playing baseball and softball and, and God, giving us the opportunity to love on, on, the stu on the kids and the students in this community, Lord. So, God, we just wanna, we just wanna open up our time together with thanks um, and giving you honor and praise, God, for, uh, for choosing us uh, to, for calling us worthy um, to be able to do your work, God. You, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like we're worthy many times, God, but you, you call us that. So, so, God, we love you, Lord. I, I pray that you'd bless our time today, Father. And we, we pray, Lord, that as we, as we walk away from today, God, that we would hear from you. God, we pray that each and every time we open your word, that, that, we, would, that we would be able to hear from you and apply it to, your, to our lives. And, and so, God, we, we ask that again this morning, God, that you would speak to our hearts. Um, God, use, um, God, use your word in, in mighty ways to penetrate our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So a couple truths that we see in nature, some of these are kind of fun, right? So the first one is how our eyes adjust in the dark. So we talked about this in, in youth group a couple Wednesdays ago about how, man, if you're waking up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom, right? When you wake up, let's say you have a pretty dark room, you can kind of see everything, right? You see the Lego, you can dodge that one, you avoid kicking the dog, right? You can make it to the bathroom, but then it's it's weird how when you get to the bathroom and you flip that light on and then you try to walk back, it's why did the room get so much darker, right? And man, we, we talked about in the youth group how that's a picture of the fact that if we choose to live in darkness, eventually it's going to start not looking so dark anymore, right? I think we're seeing that in our world today every single day. And so, man, a, a beautiful picture of how God uses darkness to teach us about, about the, the consequences of walking in darkness. The, the moon reflecting the light of the sun is a cool one, right? So, so over and over again in scripture, Jesus is likened unto the sun and he's, he's shining light on a dark earth, right? And, and there's times where, where we can be used as the moon to reflect that light of the sun. So another cool uh, thing in nature where, where God's showing us a principle through the things that he created. Life coming from death is another one. So uh, my, my wife recently had our, our fourth kid. She's going to be five months this week, I think, somehow. I'm not sure that, how that happened. But those of you that have been in a birthing room, you know that's about as close to death as it gets, right? That's really difficult. And yet, <laughs> life comes from that. If you've watched Lion King anytime soon, right? Mufasa gives his, his speech about how there's a circle of life, right? Things have to die for things to live. And, and, and obviously our, our Savior Jesus Christ is the ultimate example of that. Because of his death, burial, and resurrection, we all now have life. We can be new creatures, and he can make all things new in us. Water reflecting. Brian mentioned this a couple of weeks ago in his message, but man, if we were all to walk out to the, to the pond today and we look down, we would see our own reflections. Well, the Bible is likened unto water. And so when, when we read the Bible, we can see ourselves for who we really are. James talks about that. And so even if we think we're doing all right, we open up God's word and he starts to convict us and starts to show us things. And all of a sudden we realize, man, I've got some work to do. And then the last one is the one where we're going to focus on today. It's weeds being a picture of sin. So can any gardeners in the room, can I get an amen? amen. Okay, thank you. Randy already told me amen this morning because if this is your job throughout the week or to do, you know, to, to take care of a garden or whatever, you know weeds are so annoying. There's so many crazy things about them, and, and there's so many beautiful, or I say beautiful, but there's so many ways that it, that it ties into sin as well that we can learn about our own struggles while pulling those silly little weeds. And so um, it's kind of my job at, at church here to, to take care of the softball fields. And so when we came back from camp this year, I looked out, and the field was just covered in weeds. And, I, man, I was... I almost got a sick feeling in my stomach coming back from camp just looking at all the work to do to make the fields look right again, right? So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Romans chapter 1.
I'm going to steal one of the things Brian talked about at camp because it was so good. Romans chapter 1, we will start in verse 21. So as we're thinking about these pictures that God gives us in nature, we, we see one here that, that really resonates with our camp theme um, about thankfulness. So if we take a look at Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 21, it says, Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this, cause God, uh, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affection, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their own knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, verse 31, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So if you're following along with me during that list of sins, those are some bad ones. There's not very many good words in that passage that we just read. And, and yet, when the, the first verse that we read comes back to the fact that this whole list of sins begins with a thought in verse 21 that says, Because that when they knew not God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. And so Brian used that, that passage at camp to talk about how, man, this whole list of sins and this, this um, tendency in our hearts to do wrong comes from a lack of thankfulness. And man, you wouldn't think that, would you? A lot of times we think of thankfulness as just, yeah, I got to say thanks when, uh, when I get my cheeseburger at McDonald's, right? And I need to say you're welcome. And we have to follow all these manner things, right? But yet this tells us that us not being thankful leads to this darkness and these sins that, man, that, that are so difficult in our lives to overcome. And so going on with our camp theme, right, about how we're supposed to give thanks to God, but then also seeing this, this, uh, this likened of, of weeds um, and sin, man, we know that, that sin in our lives is similar to weeds that, man, it can just spread like wildfire. It doesn't take much. It's, it's, I, I don't know if they're, they're supposed to be like bunnies that reproduce all the time, but weeds are just reproducing every second of the day, it seems like. There's been many times where, where I go work on the fields and I'm like, man, I put in a good three hours pulling weeds. This should look good tomorrow. And guess what? You go up there, there's more. Where do they come from? It's frustrating to say the least, right? <laughs> But we, I'd, I'd like for us to look this morning at some of the things that, that I think are, are likened to sin and, and weeds in our lives. Because, man, we, we see this, this concept, right? And we can learn, just like we talked about reading the Word of God, we, when, when pulling those weeds, we can be learning about ourselves. So the first one, as we look, how are weeds like sin? Weeds grow when left unattended. Weeds grow when left unattended. Check out James 1, 14 and 15. It says, But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And there's this principle that we see in nature and in our, in our lives and in the Scripture as well that we don't have to work on, on, on growing our sin in our lives, do we? It, does, it seems like there's all those memes on Facebook, right, of how, how does this house plant 
refuse to live, no matter all the attention that it gets, and yet this weed somehow can grow with no light, no sun, or no, uh, no water, right? No cultivation, nothing. It just grows out of nowhere. How does that happen? And it's because it's a picture of our sin. See, we as believers, if we want to honor God with our lives, it's going to take some work, and it's going to take some intention and, and, and being in, intentional with, uh, with our actions, right, and allowing God to change us. But if we, if, if for whatever reason we want to see sin grow in our lives, just sit back and watch because it'll happen. See, you have to prevent weeds from going, growing, and in the same way, we have to prevent sin in our lives by allowing God to inhabit us and to walk in the Spirit so that we don't then fulfill the lust of the flesh. And man, the, we, the, we see this over and over again where, man, it, it just seems like we, we think we're getting victory in an area in our lives, and then all of a sudden, we, we take a step back just because we, we got off point for just a little bit. The next point is weeds grow anywhere. I took this picture up at the sports park yesterday. Um, so this is, this is what the, the fields looked like when I got home from camp. And it's not, honestly, it's worse than this picture shows because as you, if you were to walk, if you were to keep walking, there's more and more and more, right? But how, man, how does that happen? I was gone for five days. And yet you come back and it looks like this, right? And then there's another picture up there of, so recently we put in turf um, in between the pavilion and the, the playground, right up at the sports park. This is a weed growing through the turf. <laughs> what in the, and this, like this, we didn't go to Home Depot and buy some cheap turf that, you know, cost three bucks, uh, you know, whatever per square foot or whatever. We, we actually got this from one of the high schools that gave it to us after they took it off of their football field. This turf was so heavy duty, it took four of us to unroll the roll. And yet somehow this stupid little weed can grow through there. How does that happen? But man, it, it's such, a, it's such a, a sobering picture of our sin, right? Because it seems like sin can pop up anywhere. Man, I, being at camp, how, how do you come home from, from camp and then all of a sudden sin smacks you in the face? How, how does that happen? Because it can, it can come anywhere. No matter what you're doing, we have to be on guard. I, I was talking to Brownie a couple weeks ago, and he, and he shared with me one of the hardest things that he shared with me about, about his role as a shepherd is to always be on point. Because you never know. You never know when somebody needs your counsel, when somebody needs your, your encouragement, your edification, right? And in the same way, we as believers, we have to be on point all the time because sin creeps up out of nowhere. It doesn't seem to need water. It doesn't seem to, to, to need a soft ground. It can grow on the hardest of grounds. It seems like it can grow through anything, even turf, right? And then also, another thing that I noticed was that it seems to grow near rocks, which is kind of interesting. So as you can imagine, I spent, I think between Gabe and Brownie and myself, we probably put in at least 10 man hours pulling weeds this week. Brownie was up here at like 6 a.m. pulling weeds, man. But as I was like digging in to, to grab the root of the weed, I, I noticed a lot of times when you shove that, that trowel in there or whatever you're using, a lot of times you're hitting rock. And it's like, why would a weed decide to grow right next to a rock? There's got to be better locations. This, we're talking about our sports park here, right? There's plenty of, of dirt. It could grow anywhere. But yet, for some reason, really consistently, that weed decides to nestle in right next to that rock. Why? And so as we think back to the parable of the sower, the rocky ground, the verse 6 is up here that shows the initial um, explanation of, of the parable, and then verse 13 is when Jesus goes back and explains it. But he talks about how there, there's rocky ground and that we're, we're in danger uh, of, man, our, our faith being damaged when, when we go through trials and tribulation, when we have that, when, the, when that rocky ground is present in our lives. And so verse 6 says, and some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And then he goes on to explain, they on the rock are they, which when they hear, receive the word with joy, and these have no root, which for a while believe, and in time of temptation fall away. So we see this example that rocky ground pictures trials and temptation in our lives. 
And so when we were talking about this, this passage in the youth group, because um, the, the, this parable of the sower is what our youth group is named after. It's primed. Uh, we, we, our little tagline is we desire to be good ground so that we bear fruit whenever God, whenever we receive the word of God, right? And so we've talked about this multiple times for some of our upperclassmen. And then while we were teaching it, I really stopped to think, what do the rocks picture? Because if, if, if we know that rocky soil pictures a, a trial or a temptation in our lives, does that mean the rocks picture trials and temptations? But then as I started to think about that, I was like, no, that doesn't make sense because if we're called to be good ground, God's not calling us to remove all the trials and temptations out of our lives. And so being good ground doesn't mean that you don't have any trials and temptations. In fact, you may have more. Once again, we studied Job. Mo those trials that he went through were because he was faithful to God. And so rocks can't be these trials and temptations. So what are they? So check out, check out um, th this passage in, in 1 Peter. 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 8. It's on your screen, or you can turn there. It says, verse 4, To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on, on him shall not be confounded. Verse 7. Unto you therefore which believe, he is, uh, sorry, unto, unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. Unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were, they were appointed. So rocks here in this passage are likened unto two things. One of them is the chief cornerstone, which is our Savior Jesus Christ. But then on the flip side, it says, ye are lively stones. So how does that work? How, 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 how does rocky soil mean I'm in there? So let's look at another one, Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone and whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord and whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the spirit. Once again, we are likened unto stones. And so, man, maybe this fits together in, in a cool way of if me going through trials and temptations is going to be diff more difficult if I have more of myself in the trial. Maybe those trials are going to be dangerous in our lives if my focus is on me. Instead of wondering, how can God use this trial in my life to further his kingdom? How can God use this, this tough time in my life for me to be a blessing to somebody else? See, because I don't think anybody in here wants to, it, we may say we don't want to go through trials, but at the end of the day, if you haven't been through anything, good luck counseling somebody. We, we have a shepherd that if you walk into his office with, with a tough thing that you're going through, he can relate. He lost his daughter. Nobody, nobody can wa walks in there thinking, oh, this guy hasn't been through anything. And so, man, but, but, but it's important that we see that we, we've got to remove ourselves because if, if a trial and temptation comes along and our eyes are on ourselves, all we're thinking about is how am I going to get out of this? How, how is this going to affect me? What, what am I going to lose, right? Instead of thinking of God and saying, God, what can you accomplish through me through this difficult time? Those rocks in there make it hard because they're a picture of us. The more of us that's in that situation the more, the, the, the more difficult that, that trial is going to be in our lives. Obadiah 3 says it in a cool way. We've been doing, we just started a refined Bible study on Saturday nights, and we've been studying, we just started, but we've been studying the one-chapter books of the Bible, which is kind of cool. So last night I heard several different students say, I don't think I've ever read Obadiah. I'm like, sweet. Well, now that, that's changed, right? Obadiah 3 says, The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee, 
Thou hast dwelleth in the cliffs of the rock, whose habitation is high, that saith in his heart, who shall bring me down to the ground? And if you're familiar with this book, he's talking about Edom, which is the nation of, of Esau, right? And so he's talking about not only was, was Edom a prideful people, but also they literally dwelt up, up, up high. So they not only figuratively looked down on other people, but they physically looked down on other people, right? And so while we were talking about that in Bible study, uh, Maddox asked us, hey, what's the, what's the one verse that stuck out to you? And this was mine. The pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. I mean, when you think about that, how often do we let our own focus, our, our, own, our, our own focus on ourselves and all the situations around us deceive us? See, because, I mean, you, you hear people um, around earth on college campuses today that they're, they're so focused on, hey, why doesn't God do this? Or why did God allow this? And all the, all the focus is on wh- how God's interacting with me that they're deceived, because they, they're not looking at, the, the focus is supposed to be on him, not us. And so we can let pride deceive us so that when we're in the midst of a trial or a temptation, we're so focused on ourselves that we don't even see what God's going to do in our lives. Brian, Brian mentioned this at camp, but man, that Romans 8.28 passage applies really well here because it says that, um, that, that if we allow him, he's going to work all things together for the good to them that love him and live according to his purpose. And so if we're claiming that verse, the reality of it is you're going to go through trials no matter what. If you choose to walk with him, he's going to use it for good. If you're not, you, you're just going through trials for no reason. There's no growth there. You're not being grown because of the things that, you're, that are going on in your life. So if you're sitting here today and you're trying to figure out, man, should I follow this God? Just logically, you should follow him because instead of just be, going through pain and suffering just, just because of this, this sinful world we live in, God can use it to grow and to change us into men and women that, that honor him. We see one of the most quoted verses in, uh, in the Bible, John 3.30 says, He must increase, but I must decrease. And man, that, that rocky soil that, that we all go through at times, if, man, if we can decrease ourselves and have our eyes on God and watch what he's doing, man, we're, we're going to see that, that God truly is using those things for the good if we're paying attention. And we talked a lot about this at camp with that theme of, of thankfulness, right, of how when, when we decide to be thankful, it completely flips things on its head. I, I use the analogy... I don't know about you guys, but I bite my lip entirely too much. I don't know what's going on. I don't, I don't know if my jaw's defective, whatever, but every week it seems I'm biting my lip. And if, if I'm coming from a place of frustration, right, because I'll be honest, if I could remove one thing from this earth, that might be it. So frustrating because then when you bite it, it gets big and swells up and then you bite it again. So frustrating. But yet, if I'm coming at it from a frustration standpoint, then I'm going to bite my lip and be like, man, why am I so uncoordinated I can't even chew without biting myself? And please forget, I'm not trying to liken your trials and temptations to me biting my lip, but we're here, so we might as well finish. If, <laughs> if, but from a place of thankfulness, right, maybe the next time I bite my lip, I can go, you know what? I made it three weeks. That was a good run. Praise the Lord. <laughs> right? So, man, I know that's a silly example, but it's, it's a simple shift to just approach things from an, from an attitude of thankfulness instead of, once again, going through trials and tribulations and just allowing them to beat you down. So the next example that we see is that sin, sin's roots can run deep. So that is one of the weeds that, that we pulled. And, man, that thing goes deep, doesn't it? And that's probably not even the longest one, but, but man, a lot of times you're digging in to, to get that root so that, it's, so that, that the, the weed will come up and it's not, um, it's not gonna, just going to grow back in two weeks. And sometimes you've got to keep digging and keep digging. And then when you think you're at the bottom, you pull and the root snaps in your hands. And guess what? Nothing's growing back, right? You can either choose to then keep digging and keep going to get it, or you can choose to walk away realizing that, yep, we're going to have to address this next week, right? And so as we were pulling a lot of weeds this week, I, I noticed that the weeds are, are often really different. And, and I will say this with a caveat, 
any green thing on that field is bad to me. I'm trying to get it all up, right? Because we want a dirt field. So I know that's not the same for you all gardening. Mindy had me, you know, called me out on that because she said not all weeds are bad. And I was like, all right, I got you. But in my, for my purposes, I don't want any green on that field, right? But each time I dug and, and got a new weed, and you can kind of tell they all kind of look different from the surface, but some of them were like this, where it's one central root. I can't, I is it root or root? Okay, I'm going to try to say root, but I'll probably mess up. One central root that just digs as far as possible. It's going down deep and going down deep and going down deep. And I think that's a picture of in our lives, sometimes we have sin issues that it's not affecting everything around us, but it's affecting us very deeply. Uh, on the flip side, some of the, sometimes when you pull those weeds, it doesn't have a very deep root, it, root, it comes up, right? But it's just, it has all these millions of roots that are, that are just spread out, trying to grab everything that it can. And I think our sin is like that too, right? For instance, if you struggle with anger, maybe that's not very deeply rooted, rooted in your life, I don't know, right? But it's probably affecting lots of areas of your life. When you get cut off in traffic and the bad words you wanna say pop into your head, when a family member does something dumb and you think bad things about them too, right? See, anger affects many different areas of our lives, but perhaps it's not very deeply rooted. Maybe, maybe it's just a simple thing of, of desiring to, to please the Lord more. Whereas a sin like sexual fornication, right? You may be able to hide that. You may be able to, to, to brush it to the side and it's not affecting that many areas of your life, but man, that root is deep. It's, down, it, it's gonna be hard to pull up. You're gonna have to dig deep. You're gonna have to allow God to, to, to break the ground around you and get super deep so you can get the whole thing out so that you can truly address the problem instead of just trying to take off the top, right? And so, man, we, we see this, that, that, that sin is, is a picture of, of weeds and how their, their roots can, can run deep. So I have a tool to show you. Um, first service had no clue what it was, and I don't blame them. Um, but does anybody know what this thing is? I don't know. I, maybe you said the right answer. I just didn't hear you. But when I looked it up, this is called a scuffle hoe. And it is meant to run across the ground, once again, for me pulling weeds on the sports park and the, and the dirt on the softball fields, great, because I'm cutting everything. I don't want anything left, right? And so a, a year and a half ago, I was looking up de-weeding tools, and guess what? This thing showed up, and I was like, we have two of these in our garage that I've done nothing with for two years, right? And so I, I got it out, and I started using it, and it's pretty simple. I'm kind of tall, so I have to bend down, but you, all you do is shove it across the ground, and this part over here is pretty sharp, and so all it does is just cut the root off right at the front. So you, the bad part is the, the root's still there. However, we got rid of the problem, right? So if it's three o'clock and we've got softball games starting at four and field one's a mess, I can grab this and make it look real good in 40 minutes. However, I know in the back of my head, all I'm doing is, is, is cleaning up and shoving things in a closet. Imagine people are coming over uninvited to your house or you've asked your child to clean their room. It may not, it, it may not be done right, but it looks okay. And so uh, about a year and a half, I decided to start, to start using this thing and it works for the most part. It does the job of, man, when you look at that field, it, it's not covered in weeds anymore, right? However, the visible part of the weed is gone, but if, if God were looking at my heart and not just the, the physical manifestations of my sin, he would still see that it's covered in roots. They're everywhere. Why? Because instead of addressing the problem, all I did was cut off the manifestation of it to where I look okay. So that when I come to church on a Sunday morning, I can go, I can walk in and nobody's looking at me because I look okay, right? No, no, no big deal. But inside, I, I know that yep, next week I'm gonna have to deal with that sin again because all, all I did was cut the top of it off, right? And so uh, the next picture here shows, um, sh shows a really cool, so I'll, I'll use this phrase, uh, you, none of your friends or family will understand it, but 
I think God's calling us not to scuffle our sin. It's, it's tempting to just get rid of it, make it look okay, but, but at the end of the day, we're, we're not really doing anything. And so there, there's a picture up here of a, of a root that had been scuffled many, many times. Look how thick and fat that root is. But at the top, it doesn't look that bad. There's a few little leaves on it. And you can actually even see some little prongs are growing off that have been cut off. I don't know how many times, but that, that root has probably been scuffled four or five times and never properly addressed. I mean, I, I just wonder how, how much sin in our life looks like this in our hearts. On, on the outside, we look fine. No, no problems. Your, your friends and family probably think you're doing good. But underneath, God knows there, there's, there's stuff growing in there that, that's not to be there. And, and man, God, as, as our gardener, wants to address it. But we have to give him permission to do so. If, if, if you want to hold on to that root in your life and, and not allow God to take it up, he's not going to force you. You can hold on to it as long as you want. And so, as you can imagine, I, I came back from camp and I was faced with the field that, that looked terrible, right? And I had to make a decision. I knew we had a problem. I had been scuffling weeds for a year and a half, and it was compiling and compiling and compiling. And I could have gone back out there, scuffled them again, and it would have looked okay the next day. But there was a deeper problem. And so what I did, I started researching other tools. I don't know why I did that, because that's kind of how my problem started. But I started researching other de-weeding tools, and I found one that, like, you shove in the ground. It's got, like, hooks, and you step on it, and then you turn it, and it, like, pulls the whole weed up, right? And so I texted Brownie, and I said, hey, what do you think of this tool? Do you think we should get it? Do you think it's, it's worth the cost, right? And he texted back. I, I don't think I'll ever forget this phrase. He said, every tool that's in our garage that pulls weeds, he says, I didn't buy it. And then he said, I pulled every single weed by hand. Now, if you've been around First Bible for a few years, you know Brownie has been working on that sports park for decades. He's, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary, right? He has been, I don't know how many weeds that is, but that's a lot. And to say that I pulled every single one by hand is, is, a, is an impressive statement to make. I've been working on it for four years and I can't say that. But it, what it did is it showed me the heart of our shepherd. Because Brownie's desire is for us to be a holy people, right? That when we present ourselves to God, God is pleased with the way that we're, we're living. But he can go about that two different ways. He could encourage us to scuffle by giving us a bunch of rules to follow so that when somebody walks into our church doors and they see us, we look pretty good. We're all scuffled up, no weed showing, we look all right. But that's not who our shepherd is. Brownie desires to pull every single weed by hand, which means perhaps months of counseling and sitting down with people to say, hey, we, we've got to address the actual problem. The symptoms aren't, aren't the problem, right? The leafy stuff on top isn't the problem. The problem is the root. And so, man, I, I'm so thankful for that. And, and man, I think it's a challenge for every single one of us that if we desire to be sanctified men and women who love the Lord, we're going to have to put in the work. If, you, if we've decided to allow sin in our lives, we then have to be, be willing to put in the work to go, to go get it all back out instead of just cutting it off and hoping that, hey, m maybe, maybe it'll look good tomorrow. And man, you're probably wondering why this bucket's up here, right? <laughs> I think instead of bringing that with me in the gator on, on Monday to go pull weeds, I think I'm going to bring this. So this has, I don't know what you call this thing, a digging knife? I don't know. What is it? Okay. So you shove it in, right? And we're going to dig deep with this thing. It's got a little prongs on the end, right? But guess what? I'm going to have to probably get on my hands and knees, put my knees on some rocks that's not going to feel very good. I'm probably going to have to use some gloves, right? I got a lot of blisters this week. And then I'm going to have to bring this bucket with me because I don't want to just leave those weeds sitting around, right? We've got to get them out. I don't know if this is actually true, but maybe they'll reroot. I don't know. Somebody can let me know later, right? But instead of bringing my, my, my scuffle, I'm going to start bringing that bucket with me because I desire not only just to make the fields look good, okay, but I desire for God to teach me that if, if sin's going to be dealt with in my life, it's going to take some hard work.
and it's gonna take some time, and it's gonna take some effort, and instead of sweating up there, it's probably gonna take some tears, okay? But we know the, the result is gonna be better because we're allowing God to do the work instead of just trying to cover it up so that we all look good, right? And so, man, I, I think we could all think of different ways that we've scuffled uh, weeds, right? Perhaps if you've got that anger problem we talked about earlier, maybe your scuffling is just you saying, hey, I'm gonna pick and choose who I yell at. Because if I yell at somebody who's gonna call me out on it, then now I'm gonna get my sin exposed. But if I, if I yell at the, the Walmart cashier, they're not gonna know. I'll, I'll, I'll look around to see if anybody knows me, but they're not gonna find out, right? We're good. But that's scuffling, right? I'm only, I, I'm, I'm only covering up my sin where it, actually, where, where it actually affects me. Or maybe we use false humility to cover up our pride. Okay, I have finally hit the age where when I go to youth camp, I can't beat every student in basketball. It's a sad day. I'll, I'm still gonna try, I'm gonna hold on for a few more years, right? But Tucker Hughes, right, he's an upcoming senior, he's pretty good, okay? He, he played a little bit of varsity last year, and so when we played one-on-one, -on -one, I'm having a hard time keeping up with him now. He's a shooter, I'm a big man, I don't like to get out of the paint, right? And so that doesn't work very good on a shooter. And so imagine we play one-on-one -on -one and he beats me. I, 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 have, I have two options. I can take the scuffling route and I can say, oh, well, I just, I had a bad shooting day. <laughs> And, and take all the, the praise from him beating me and, 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 and just try to redirect it to say, nah, you didn't really beat me, I just, I just didn't make shots, right? Or I can say, hey, Tucker, good game. You were shooting well, I couldn't keep up with you, nice job. See that, one is false humility that says, hey, I, I have a pride issue that I'm gonna try and cover up, right, by saying I'm not good. See, it's not prideful to say I'm bad or I had a bad shooting day, right? Maybe it actually is. And maybe that's just us scuffling our, our pride. And man, perhaps the greatest example of scuffling is David. One of the most incredible men in scripture, but man, the day that he decided to stay home from war and to go on his rooftop and, and look at Bathsheba, that day he started scuffling. Because then, now there's a baby in the mix. How do, how do I cover up this baby? I'll, I'll send Uriah onto the front line so that he, so that he dies and or I'll, I'll bring him back so that, that they'll, they'll have some time to create a baby, right? And then I'll send him out and he'll be killed, right? I'm scuffling, I'm scuffling, I'm scuffling. And man, we can go back and, and read in, in First and Second Samuel how that worked for him. How, how, did, how did covering up his sin end up? Because man, the, the Bible tells us pretty clearly that your sin will find you out. So if we choose to continue to scuffle and continue to scuffle, we're, we're gonna pay the price for it. And so I have two encouragements for you. Sorry, it's been a downer. Um, I have two encouragements for you if you're in that place where, man, I feel like I'm scuffling. I don't know why, I, that song came in my head all week of every day I'm scuffling. I know that's not how it actually goes, but. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll actually get that song out of my head this next week. But the first one is that we have to start falling in love. And I know that sounds silly. Why would you wanna fall in love to stop sinning? But the reality of it is, when, if I'm so focused on the sin in my life, I, I'm, I'm, man, God, please don't let me do this today. Please don't let me do this today. Please don't let me do this today, right? My eyes are really focused on that sin. I'm looking at it over and over again, and then when I mess up, uh, I feel terrible, and uh, my eyes are just so focused here. But, but the reality of it is, if we choose to focus our energy on falling in love with our Savior, eventually over time, those things just get less important. That I wonder, some of you that are, that are married in here, do you struggle with looking at members of the opposite sex that aren't your wife or that, that aren't your husband? See, the fix for that isn't to walk around with dark sunglasses so you can't see very well. Or the fix isn't to start going to Walmart instead of Target because there's less good looking people in there, okay? <laughs> that's, that's not the fix, right? You can try those things and maybe they'll work for a few weeks but they're, they're ultimately not gonna solve your problem. See, what, what you need to do is you need to fall in love with your spouse all over again. So that when you look at her, when you look at him, you're so enamored with that person that man, this stuff just doesn't matter anymore. 
when you see when you see a good looking girl or good looking guy and, and you're tempted to go look man i, I they've got nothing on my wife i know that for sure <laughs> so pray man our desire to, if, if we desire to see sin start to, to, to vacate from our lives we, we've got to start falling in love mark twelve thirty says and thou shalt love the lord thy god with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength this is the first commandment and the second one i have for you is that we need to allow god to search us we need to allow god to search us this is a very quoted um, verse in the Bible, but we added a few extra verses to the end um, that, that we don't read quite as often. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. It shall be health to thy navel, and marrow to thy bones. And I think we need to be reminded of the fact that in this whole spiritual analogy of getting weeds up out of our lives, we're not the gardener. Yeah, I'm the one moving the scuffle hoe around and, and making the decisions, but in, in the parable of the sower, you're the ground. It's your savior that's the one that, that's going in and removing the weeds and, and, and plowing the, the, the dirt so that it's, it's good to grow. And so if, if we want God to change us, to, to make us into sanctified men and women, what it's going to take is it's going to take us letting go. See, if you're a gardener in here, I swear there's little hands in the dirt grabbing onto that root sometimes, isn't there? I haven't found them yet, but I think they're in there. But we as believers, we have to let go. If you, if you truly are okay with God taking that sin out of your life, then You've got to spiritually and physically let go of it so that he can do what he so desperately desires to do in our lives to begin with. And so, man, if we as a church body decide to stop scuffling, it's also going to take a very important thing, and that thing is grace. See, because we as, as believers, I think, I think if we're thinking about this all in our heads, we're thinking, okay, we get all the weeds out of the way, we're looking good, right? And, and maybe it'll look like this next slide. This is field two. Looking pretty good, right? A few, a few weeds removed, but overall, there's a weed in the right-hand corner, but looks pretty good, right? Uh, Porter could play on that, right? But what the reality of it is, if we allow God to work in, work in our hearts, this next picture is what it may actually look like. See, this is what it looked like after a couple hours of Gabe and Brownie and I pulling weeds. Doesn't look very good, does it? We had to break up the ground. We had to dig. I mean, I, I tell you what, if you need weeds pulled from your ground, I'm not trying to sign them up for anything, but Gabe Lutz is your man. I don't think he left a single root in that entire field, man. His attention to detail was such a blessing. But this is what it looks like. And so... If you're walking in on Sunday morning and you see somebody that looks kind of like that field, kind of messed up, maybe some tears, some tears, some tear marks on their, on their face, you can assume that they had a bad night where they gave into the flesh. But it's possible that they actually just spent a night wrestling with God and saying, God, I really want you to remove this thing from my life. And I want to stop holding on to it. And so they may come in on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night looking like this. And if we're not a church of grace, we're not going to be working with God in this person's life. We're going to be working against him. And so we have to be men and women of grace so that, man, when, when somebody like this walks in our door, man, we're there for them. We're, 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 we're going to give them a, sh a shoulder to cry on. We're going to give them a big hug so that, man, th they, can, they can be encouraged to keep going to continue allowing God to, to work in our hearts and to, to, to sanctify us as men and women. So my last question for you, is there a sin issue that you've been scuffling lately? How can you let God root it out of your life? Maybe you've been scuffling this sin for years. Today can be the day where you decide, hey, I, I'm done with this. I'm tired of covering up my sin. I want to be a child of God that other people can see the, the struggles in my life, I can, I can pick those trusted people to share these things with so that, man, we can start to see growth and I'm not just shoving things under the bed because mom said to clean my room. So please stand as we, as we close in prayer. Father God, we, we love you. God, I thank you so much for the opportunity to gather in your house. And God, we come to you humbly knowing 
that God, e- each and every one of us has, has something in our lives, God, that, that either you've convicted us about, about sin that, that we know we need to let go of and let you, you to purge out of our lives. But then also, God, we, we've, got, we've got people in our lives that, that, that you need to work on as well, and, and we need to be there as a, as a gracious brother and sister to, to work with you in their lives as well. And so the, the altar is open this morning, and, and man, I, I don't know what decision you need to make, but maybe you need to leave today, and you need to talk to your spouse about what's going on in your heart that you haven't shared with them yet. Or maybe you need to talk to a friend, a family member, and say, hey, I, I really desire God to take this out of my life, but, but I need you to help me. Or maybe, once again, you, you need to be a gracious brother and sister that allows God to work through you. To, to de-root, to de-weed th- those around you and, and for you to edify them when they're, at, when they're at their darkest hour. So come, the altar's open.